Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our um, Education Tonight update on Parkinson's disease with Professor Simon Hawke. I'd like to acknowledge that we work on the traditional lands of many Aboriginal clans and nations. I pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge their continuing connection to land, water and culture, an ongoing contribution to help shape the life of the communities in which we all work and live. I warmly welcome Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians who are present in the meeting tonight. A little bit of housekeeping. We will take questions at the end of the evening. If you can use chat to um, put your questions through, that would be great. We're recording tonight's meeting, so hopefully we'll be able to have that available to you on the PA team website um, within a few days. There are some videos within Professor Hawke's presentation and apologies, they may be a little bit glitchy just because of the size of the, of the videos. So tonight we're very lucky to have Professor Simon Hawke with us, who's a neurologist and has been based in Orange since 2004. He also undertakes active research in multiple sclerosis at the Vascular Immunology Unit at the Faculty of Medicine and Health Science at the Uni of Sydney. Thanks, Professor Hawke. We'll hand over to you to, to start your presentation. Great. Uh, well, thanks, thanks very much, everyone, for uh, coming along uh, to hear about uh, what's going on in Parkinson's disease. Um, Overall, of course, it's uh, it's a disease where there haven't been huge breakthroughs in the last few years. Um, the main issue, of course, is can we have a drug which slows down the underlying disease? And unfortunately, that goes for all neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, so that's the big, big question mark for neurology, um, all brain diseases. Can we stop brain cells degenerating? Um, not as yet. OK, could I have the first slide, please? We all know Parkinson's disease is common. Uh, estimated that 100,000 Australians have it, 13,000 new cases each year. It's the second most common neurodegenerative disease. Uh, I would say I'd, I'd see it probably two new cases every month, that sort of uh, sometimes more. Um, it's, uh, it's not that common in people below the age of 50. Uh, it's slowly progressive. I mentioned there's no cure, but it's a long-standing neurodegenerative disease. So if you, you're diagnosed with Parkinson's, it's a long journey for the patient and also for um, the health professionals looking after them. Next slide, please. And it's going to get more, more common. Um, these are the demographics that I'm sure we all know that uh, from 1990, the most common age group was sort of in the 25 to 30 group. And then 2010, 45 to 50 and projected 2050. Uh, we're going to have a, a large number of uh, elderly people and that is going to create uh, potentially an almost epidemic of neurodegenerative disease. OK, uh, next slide two, please. It's a disease that does get uh, more frequent um, uh, as you get older, looking at the incidence. Um, just really this slide to make the point that it's unusual to make the diagnosis in the very elderly people, but it's not that uncommon for very elderly people to have some signs of Parkinson's. Next, next slide, please. And that the underlying uh, pathophysiology of all these neurodegenerative diseases is misfolding protein, accumulating in neurons for reasons that we know something about, but not certainly everything about, uh, and uh, each different disease seems to have different uh, proteins that are accumulate. Um, the most feared and rapidly progressive, of course, is CJD with the prion protein. Um, and But we're finding out more 
important proteins all the time. So, for instance, in frontotemporal dementia, uh, there was a recent paper in Nature which showed that the fibrils that accumulate in the neurons are, in fact, a protein called TMEM106B, whereas previously we knew tau was accumulating, uh, but we thought that TDB43 may be important. So this is a brand new protein. So there's stuff emerging for these diseases all the time. Uh, and uh, a major effort is trying to uh, develop drugs which stop these uh, proteins from aggregating. Often it's not necessarily the amyloid, which is sort of the end product, but sometimes it's the uh, intermediates, the oligomers, which are the more toxic and neuro, uh, or more neurotoxic and more relevant to the disease. Um, with with Parkinson's, of course, it's one of the uh, synucleinopathies, um, uh, similar to MSA and uh, dementia with Lewy bodies. And the alpha-synuclein uh, is a, uh, a protein that even, uh, as early, even as recently as a few months ago, um, Vikram Kurana, who is uh, one of the top neurobiologists and neurologists in uh, Boston, who in fact is a University of Sydney graduate, I'd have to say, um, brother's a neurosurgeon. Uh, he, he has published a paper in Cell, his group, showing that the alpha-synuclein um, has a role in something called P bodies, which I really don't know much about, but it's important for RNA degradation in the cell. Previously, it was thought mainly to be important in vesicular trafficking and fusion. So there's more basic biology, basically, to know uh, all the time. And you know, I, I certainly feel that uh, unless we get to grips with the underlying detail of the biology, we're not unfortunately going to be able to find drugs which uh, prevent its progression. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So there are a number of factors potentially relevant for Parkinson's. I've talked about protein aggregation. Um, clearly, there are some genetic factors, although most patients with Parkinson's disease have sporadic disease. Um, the, the accumulation of the protein causes dysfunction of mitochondria um, and their secondary neuroinflammation. Um, in terms of potential causes of Parkinson's disease. We know um, that there are links epidemiologically to pesticides, so perhaps we see more Parkinson's in the country, although having said that, I see plenty of patients in Sydney, but that's certainly been a risk factor. And I just uh, thought I'd say a little bit about COVID-19, because you may know that there have been some cases of, of what seemed to be rather acute Parkinson's uh, in individuals very soon after infection with COVID-19. Uh, and we know, of course, that one of the hallmark uh, clinical features of COVID-19 is a loss of smell. And certainly with influenza, the influenza epidemic in the 1919 uh, epidemic, where there was a uh, an epidemic of post-encephalitic Parkinson's, people have subsequently shown that uh, the influenza virus gets into olfactory neurons and travels uh, really through the brain, into the, into the midbrain and up into the basal ganglia, particularly with neurovirulent uh, influenza, which thankfully we haven't seen uh, for many, many years. But uh, who knows what's happening um, with COVID-19? Herbie simplex travels through a factory neuron, so it is a bit of a concern that there that that uh, there may be problems. People have started to look into this, and they've looked in vitro at the aggregation rate. So that's the um, speed of aggregation of alpha synuclein, and uh, it's a it's a slight concern that the uh, nuclear capsid protein of um, COVID-19 
uh, can significantly up uh, uh, tempo the or increase the rate of aggregation of alpha synuclein, and this is in vitro, so uh, we do, we don't really have detailed uh, information from postmortem brain tissue yet. The the spike protein doesn't do anything, but the nuclear capsid protein that uh, encapsulates the RNA of uh, COVID nineteen can significantly um, lead to aggregation of alpha synuclein. Could I have the next slide, please? So the, the hallmark of, uh, of Parkinson's, as we know, is the loss of the dopamine producing neurons. And uh, the, uh, the sections that you see the, with the arrow, that's where the, new, the, the neurons are. And I'll just point out when we come to an MRI that the MRI uh, is oriented in the upside down version, 190 to 180 degrees. But basically, you you you're lose those little dark uh, neurons on the left are, are going and disappear eventually completely. Um, but it's not just in the substantia nigra; it's a widespread disease, and that's that's the problem with Parkinson's. Next slide, please. And these are the Lewy bodies, which are the accumulations of the alpha synuclein seen in the synucleinopathies that I mentioned. Uh, Parkinson's being the most common by far. Next slide, please. And then if we had the right uh, reactors and we could reduce uh, the right isotopes, we could conjugate uh, fluorine isotopes to dopamine and we could actually do PET scans to uh, show the uh, the, the dopaminergic neurons and you can see the difference in the signal between the normal uh, individual and the person with Parkinson's disease, which of course is often asymmetrical. Uh, next slide, please. And then we have uh, we have uh, information from the, uh, the small proportion of people who have um, genetic Parkinson's, which tend to be they tend to occur in younger individuals. It, um, there's nothing much else different about it, but the mutations uh, in the genes of, uh, are, are really important in mitochondria, causing, causing mitochondrial dysfunction, oxidative stress, and again, aggregation, and also the degradation in the um, ubiquitin proteasome system. Um, if you don't get rid of your junk proteins and neurons, of course, which have to live for many years, then uh, toxic uh, moieties will accumulate. OK, next slide, please. Now, we all know the clinical features of Parkinson's, the resting tremor, the bradykinesia, which is the main dis disabling um, symptom or, and sign of the uh, Parkinson's. Uh, muscular rigidity and stooped posture was the classical um, uh, features of Parkinson's disease. Next slide. But we know that um, that there's stuff going on uh, years sometimes before the onset of the motor symptoms, and this just uh, just highlights that. And we know about anosmia. We know about um, uh, the uh, particularly the REM sleep um, uh, dysfunction. So normally when you dream, you're paralyzed, but a very uh, early feature of, of Parkinson's is that loss of uh, motor inhibition. So people start acting out their dreams, as we know. And in fact, it's extremely worrying if you do have REM sleep dysfunction because some longitudinal studies now are indicating that over 80% of people who have REM sleep uh, disorder uh, will end up with uh, neurodegenerative disease and Parkinson's being the most common. So anyway, we'll go, we'll go uh, through a lot of these other things, but just to point out that it's a disease that's probably there for many years before the onset of the motor abnormalities and uh, where we we can actually 
uh, look in Alzheimer's disease, we find people are accumulating the A beta protein in their in their forties in many instances. That's using the um, the Pittsburgh Ligon uh, PET uh, studies, of which now people are starting to do population studies, and and so it's a very long long-standing uh, disease, Parkinson's disease. Okay, I'll have the next slide, please. So how do you make a diagnosis? Well, uh, typical clinical syndrome and signs, and then you don't want to see significant eye movement abnormalities. You don't want to see early severe postural hypotension or other system involvement, particularly pyramidal signs. You don't want to see early hallucinations in someone with Parkinsonism, and you don't want to see early cognitive impairment. You like to see a relatively normal brain MRI. Uh, there shouldn't be any current exposure to antipsychotics, but certainly we all know cases where people have been on antipsychotic medication. Clearly, they're getting worse and worse and you haven't made any changes to the treatment, and these, some of these people turn out to have Parkinson's. And you want to see a response to treatment. And that's where I think it's, as a neurologist, it's, um, it's helpful that the patient isn't treated before you see the patient. Uh, and I, the most difficult patients, I would have to say, that I look after are where the patient is already on medication and in the early stages, of course, they may have very few clinical signs. Um, and so when you're dealing with somebody who has got a disease that might last 15 years, um, you really always, it's always a bit doubtful. Uh, and it's difficult for us to, uh, to say, you know, definitely whether the patient responds. OK, so that's, that's very important for our point of view. Next slide, please. OK, we'll try this. This is um, a guy, a guy who has a rather subtle Parkinsonism. We have that. And I might. I can't hear the, the video, but that doesn't matter too much, but. Um, what we'll see is that, and we may not see it so well, but he just has, when he gets slightly stressed, a subtle resting tremor of his right hand. He probably just, it's, it's slowed up a lot um, on my uh, screen. And I, I, I basically, I brought that tremor out by getting him to to count backwards by threes or whatever. So anything that will increase anxiety uh, will bring that tremor out. Then, of course, if he has a resting tremor, the, the classical patient, it may be on one side, uh, but when they lift up their arms, it disappears. So that's why in the early stages, the tremor itself is not disabling because it's not there when you actually use your hand. Um, it's a resting tremor. So I think I think we might just move on to the next slide. Um, when when uh, these apps came out to check the frequency of tremors, I did that with a whole lot of patients. And um, yeah, you can use your iPhone. Just uh, use a rubber band to put it on the back of the hand and you can work out the tremors usually around about just over five hertz, the resting tremor. Um, and an essential tremor will, will, will generally be much faster. Could I have the next slide, please? Uh, this is another gentleman who, you'd run that. Um, not sure we're going to be able to see that well, but this, this man had bilateral resting tremor, and it's often, it's often comes out when when the patient walks. So you can see that, I mean, this guy is at this stage is playing hockey regularly, but you can see his turning with taking small steps. He's slightly stooped. He's not swinging his arms. And the tremor, because when you walk, 
uh, your hands are very free is often seen, and we call that a release tremor. Um, and and he has has typical untreated Parkinson's. Can I have the next slide, please? I'm sorry about the tremor. So here, um, if you look on the left of this MRI, and this is a T2 flare sequence, uh, you will see that that the, the central part of the brain looks like a little mouse with the nose and the two eyes and the ears. And going back to the actual sections of the, of the patient's brain that I showed earlier, the, the dopaminergic neurons are in the around that ear strip. And it's been, it, I think it's a bit disappointing that we haven't been able to better utilize um, MRI. Uh, for making a diagnosis of Parkinson's, but in fact, it isn't that sensitive uh, or specific, the loss of the neurons in that area on MRI. So um, basically we do an MRI to make sure that the patient doesn't have hydrocephalus or have severe vascular disease. Um, and that's really the main reason, and also for other particular features, which I'll come to. So let's go to the next slide. Um, and that really comes into the differential diagnosis. A central tremor, which is a tremor of the outstretched hands, it's worse with use, which is completely the opposite from a Parkinson resting tremor. Um, a drug-induced Parkinson's, um, so they're going to be on medication, um, which is relevant. Um, and then I've, I talked briefly earlier that some people who just get old have some features of Parkinson's, which doesn't necessarily mean Parkinson's disease. Um, and other people can have vascular Parkinson's with lots of mini strokes, uh, microvascular ischemic gliosis. And then you're always on the lookout for the atypical Parkinson syndromes, PSP, tauopathy, CBD. Similarly, they have their own features. PSP people often present with early falls. Uh, MSA um, will often have um, either um, a lot more ataxia, if it's a cerebellar variant, or may have early autonomic dysfunction. And then dementia with Lewy bodies, Again, don't expect in the standard patient to have significant cognitive impairment with hallucinations early on in the disease course. Next slide, please. So here's this is this patient here. We just this again. I think will probably be too subtle, but um, and um, so the previous patient just had a central tremor, which is a fine tremor. I don't know if you can see see my hand moving there. Uh, I can demonstrate these. Um, and then uh, one thing about a central tremor is that it, a bit of a, a bit of a trick. It often then can, as time goes on, can become a flapping tremor. And these tremors don't really respond that well to to treatment, and they slow down in frequency. So they, as you get older, the central tremor can become much coarser and slower. But sometimes patients with Parkinson's, as well as having a resting tremor, have a postural tremor, have a mixed phenotype. So it's a, it's, it's a little more complicated, but you want to see responses to treatment. And then the next slide, sorry, the next video. Yeah, we won't, we won't see this gentleman. He's basically an elderly gentleman who just slowed up, not really having much tremor. And uh, next slide, you'll see his MRI. And you see severe uh, low density on the T1 image on the right or in the periventricular region, a lot of atrophy. And on the T2, you, you see a lot of white matter ischemic gliosis. So this, and he's also had lacuna strokes. You can see um, one in the thalamus, but a lot of um, atrophy, as I said. So um, in fact, I, I did try him on um, levodopa treatment, and I think I think he did respond a bit, um, but uh, not typical Parkinson's. If you if you see that sort of scan, next slide, please. Uh, and it's a shame we can't see this one, but this is somebody 
someone who has PSP, early falls, um, supranuclear gaze paresis. So that's basically when you ask the patient to look up or down, they can't. But if you get them to fixate on a pen or something, you get someone to do it in front of you, and then you move their head voluntarily, get them to look at it, they can maintain fixation. So they can't do it voluntarily. Um, PSP is uncommon, but it does turn up from time to time. Next slide, please. And typically, um, you see uh, midbrain uh, atrophy, um, hummingbird sign. Um, so right in the top of the midbrain, you get this sort of elongated beak due to atrophy, um, uh, which is a typical feature of PSP. Um, some patients, of course, have a phenotype of PSP and don't have PSP. They can have multiple mini strokes causing it. Um, so again, MRI is useful to exclude that. Next slide, please. Usually much more rapidly progressive. Um, and then uh, Simon Lewis, in when he was in Cambridge, uh, wrote this nice paper. Uh, dividing patients with Parkinson's into different groups. Um, and going back to the younger onset where there'd be a higher incidence of genetic Parkinson's, often from the Parkinson's point of view, it's, it's actually not as problematic as other types, which is interesting. Although if you're starting with Parkinson's young, you're going to end up probably dying from it where you probably don't if you're starting with it at, at an older age. Uh, tremor dominant, usually if tremor's on one side, um, good response to dopamine, that's uh, benign tremorless Parkinson's. People who don't have much tremor tend to have more rapidly progressive uh, course and often greater early cognitive decline and a worse prognosis. And there, there, there are occasional people who do rapid, uh, more rapidly progress. Is it the same disease? I'm not sure. Uh, next slide, please. So um, here is uh, not a very good, clear slide, I'm afraid, but we know, we know that uh, we're losing dopaminergic cells uh, in the substantia nigra. We know that uh, when you start people on treatment, um, even with levodopa, it often works by being taken up by the remaining neurons. Although it's said that if you're going to, for instance, have benign tremulous Parkinson's, you will have lost 80% of the neurons contralateral to the site of the tremor before the motor sy uh, symptoms develop. The other side will eventually become uh, involved too, of course. So levodopa is taken up, and then we have these other drugs, and uh, selegiline and rosagiline, which inhibits a pump at the presynaptic terminal, um, which pumps out the dopamine. So it basically increases both endogenous and exogenous um, dopamine in the terminal. Um, we have other drugs working by um, blocking the degradation of the um, dopamine in the synapse, uh, the COMPT inhibitors. We have dopamine agonists, which are synthetic forms, which bind directly to the dopamine receptors on the downstream circuit. We have amantadine, which stimulates dopamine release and inhibits uptake. And each of these drugs, you know, we, we have in our armamentarium. We also have uh, cold, um, acetylcholine uh, inhibitors um, as well. Uh, next slide. So when you come to uh, seeing someone with Parkinson's, uh, you have to ask yourself, uh, do we start with levodopa? Uh, because that will work very quickly. It will uh, make the, the patient, hopefully if they've got Parkinson's disease, any disability disappear because we like to see them going back to normal with Parkinson's in the early stages. Or you could use a dopamine agonist you could try an anticholinergic. Um, in the past, we, we tended to uh, start with dopamine agonists because we thought that it might delay the onset of levodopa-induced dyskinesias. And some 
some experts have have said uh, that even a single dose of levodopa can predispose you to dyskinesia later, because in the past people that gave levodopa challenges to uh, establish diagnosis. So uh, I often do start with uh, risagiline. Um, I then might move to a dopamine agonist and then levodopa in a younger person. But in a in an older person, we want to know we want we want to know exactly if it's Parkinson's um, and to reverse their motoric features. We might start with levodopa. Now, uh, studies have uh, have um, emerged more recently saying in the longer term, probably doesn't make a lot of difference whether you start with a dopamine agonist or whether you start with levodopa. But I think what you don't want is people taking levodopa because that's the problem with it. it. You have to take it three times a day in the vast majority of people, if not more frequently. And the worst patients in my experience in terms of dyskinesia are the ones who have waited till the dopamine is wearing off before taking the other dose rather than having it um, regularly because um, wearing off might predispose you to um, big fluctuations, predispose you to dyskinesia. Next slide, please. Uh, Sagiline, um, we used to use selegiline, but there are big problems with selegiline and, um, and antidepressants. There are still potential issues with risagiline, but it's um, highly selective. It's been around for a long time. Um, it works by, as I say, block, blocking that pump on the terminal um, of the dopaminergic neuron, increasing the levels. It doesn't actually work that much uh, on its own. So, um, so if, if people do respond to it, I think it tells you in the early stages that they've got quite a few neurons left. Um, but then there was a study indicating that it might be neuroprotective, but I think the consensus now is that uh, that study was a bit of an artifact. So I think the bottom line, unfortunately, for Parkinson's is that there isn't a drug that we know which slows down the dying off of neurons and goes for all neurodegenerative disease. Uh, next slide, please. There's a newer version called safinamide. Um, yeah, I don't really feel that it, it adds that much. Um, and the clinical trials, there's certainly some data which suggests it might pr promote on time. It might be better with non-motor effects, but from a practical point of view, in my experience, it doesn't, um, it, it, they don't make huge differences, these, uh, these MAOB inhibitors. Next slide, please. Don't mean agonist. In the past, we used cabergoline. Now we would tend to use retigotine, the patch, or pramipexol. Took a long time for the company to get the patch to work in our in the Australian environment with heat, but I think it does work. But just remember, with the patch, that uh, you can only prescribe up to eight milligrams on the PBS, and it makes a lot of sense to use the patch. Slow leaching out, continuous stimulation of the downstream circuit, but it's four times less potent milligram per milligram than pramipexol. So if you suddenly switch people from pramipexol to retigotine, they can go into withdrawal because they're not getting enough dopamine agonist. Uh, I've talked about the dopamine agonist levodopa uh, question. Um, next slide, please. And as the Parkinson's progresses, you will see that levodopa requirement goes up. Uh, most people start wearing off. It doesn't last as long, so you have to uh, reduce the interval. And, and these are sort of, this is the time I think where, um, you know, uh, if, um, you know, if you want to make adjustments to the patient, it's clear that things are waking off. I think just do that, I think. Um, um, having made the diagnosis, happy happy that the patient's got the disease. You know, we're so busy at the moment, uh, we need another four neurologists, I reckon. Um, we, you know, if, if, the patient, if it's clear that the patient's wearing off, reduce the interval. Um, 
if patients on levodopa, um, just standard matopyr or cinemet, try cinemet CR if if it's wearing off because that might la last longer, or Stilevo, which is entacapone um, added to cinemet basically, and that will tend to make the medication uh, interval interval between each dose last longer. But at the end of the day, you often have to keep reducing the interval because of wearing off. Um, and then there are the non-motor problems, which uh, become more and more problematic. The postural instability, um, more cognitive decline. Um, uh, these, these are the sort of the, uh, the problems that indicate that Parkinson's itself is a widespread disease eventually. Uh, not just related to the, you know, the motor system, extra, motor, extra pyramidal system. Next uh, slide, please. Um, and yeah, depression is very common. Anxiety is very common. Um, a sense of smell, not usually a, an issue, but you always ask them. Uh, the sleep disturbance, which can antedate the onset by some years. Not a good thing to have, as I mentioned. Um, and yeah, Parkinson's disease is a great disease early on, but as we know, becomes more and more problematic as time goes on. Next slide, please. Um, this is just an algorithm um, from uh, therapeutic guidelines. Um, I've, I've sort of touched on this. You know, if you start off with levodopa, they're wearing off. You can try and increase the dose a little bit, but you den generally have to switch to something which is a bit longer lasting, either long acting uh, Cinemet CR controlled release. Unfortunately, the Matapar version doesn't work that well, the HBS um, or Stilevo. Um, it's a shame we don't have the, um, the uh, add on um, and tacopone because that's available in the UK, which means you can just add it as a single daily dose uh, to whatever you've got the patient on, whether it be Matapar or, or Cinemet. Um, but uh, yeah, you've got to reduce the interval. You can add in a dopamine agonist uh, to try and uh, reduce the fluctuations uh, if you've got wearing off. If you've got dyskinesia, you can you can try and work out whether you think it's peak dose dyskinesia or end of dose or diphasic dyskinesia. Um, if it's end of dose dyskinesia, which can tend to be more severe, you can you can reduce that by increasing the dose. Um, you can generally do stuff to fiddle around with the medication in the sort of middle stage of the Parkinson's. Um, and then things sort of just get worse and worse. Next slide. And I'm sure people will have questions about all of this. Um, postural hypotension is a big issue. Um, it becomes more and more problematic. And some patients at the end of the day just end up, you know, they can't stand up because they faint and they end up wheelchair bound in very advanced patients. But you can do simple things like increase salt and water intake, in the UK, we used to suggest people put their heads of bed up on blocks. I don't think that's ever been subjected to a proper randomized control study. Um, but we tend to use fluid recortisone, pyridostigmine, um, domperidone, and then mitodrine now is easier to get than it used to be. Um, and that and that often works, works quite well. Um, Bladder symptoms, just the standard sort of stuff, and this doesn't um, have mirror Begron, which we use as well. Constipation, as you know, just standard sort of things. One, one issue which is a big problem is psychosis. And of course, the antipsychotics tend to make the Parkinson's worse, but if you use low doses, um, it's a problem. Uh, sorry, it's less of a problem, and it can work in the early stages, but yeah, look, I can think of numbers of patients who psychosis and not, we're not just talking about, uh, you know, form visual hallucinations, which usually worry the patient less than the um, than the family. Um, but we, if we're talking about psychosis, um, it can be a big problem and and um, 
I'm very grateful to be able to get the uh, input from old age um, psychiatrists. And uh, but my it's it's a difficult problem. It's a difficult problem for everyone. There are some new drugs which are not available in Australia, which may improve things, but they haven't. They've been in the pipeline. They haven't uh, come in. Uh, so I'm not quite sure where they are with the TGA. Next, next slide, please. Um, so now we're we're in the the later stages of the disease. We're looking at people who have frequent motor fluctuations. Um, the, uh, the the medication doesn't seem to be working that well, so we can we we can move to non um, uh, oral agents, and the main ones we tend to use are apomorphine. Nothing to do with morphine. It's a very potent dopamine dopamine agonist that's been around for years, and it often helps to get the patient um, started with uh, a self injector, which can kick in in five minutes and five to 10 minutes and lasts about an hour. And that's often a useful prelude to switching them to an infusion, which is given by a subcutaneous uh, uh, pump. And I I've got the odd patient who's been on apomorphine for you know some years, maybe eight years. Uh, often people get subcutaneous nodules, but if uh, people really work hard at massaging the previous infusion sites, that seems to be less of an issue. Um, and I, I, I've got one particular patient who you, you know, you'd hardly know they had Parkinson's, but if they, if their infusion stop, uh, they're paralyzed. They basically can't move at all. It's really quite, quite dramatic. Um, another uh, route is to pump duodopa past the stomach into the jejunum via a peg J tube. Uh, and then there are other uh, more advanced treatments with um, of DBS. Um, uh, the main the main uh, negative issues with DBS are that it's not that good to uh, put DBS start DBS in people who've got significant cognitive impairment. So that'll be a big negative. But for you know very marked motor fluctuations, um, dyskinesia then uh, DBS certainly should be considered. And when I was a neurologist at Charing Cross Hospital, we did lesional surgery. Um, and it was amazing. You'd see people with marked Parkinsonism on the Friday and see them on the Monday evening and they were hugely, hugely better. But DBS is much more, has much more finesse. It has each electrode's got four different um, stimulator points that can individually be um, adjusted. Um, but for the country, that's an issue. We we don't um, adjust DBS ourselves. Um, it can it might be able to be adjusted in Dubbo, but I'm not sure now. I'm not sure Simon Lewis is going to Dubbo. Um, so that might mean fairly frequent trips in the early stages to Sydney uh, centres to have the uh, have their um, DBS adjusted. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of where the uh, the DBS uh, electrodes are sited, uh, probably doesn't make a huge amount of difference whether it's the globus pallidus uh, or the subthalamic uh, nuclei uh, nucleus. I should say there's there've been studies comparing now um, two different sites, and uh, for a while people thought that SDN stimulation might be better for dyskinesia, but think now uh, maybe that's the other way around looking at uh, very systematic reviews of, of the studies. So um, how, does, how does that work? Well, I think the, the basic philosophy is that the stimulation itself allows you to reduce the levodopa and so that therefore uh, reduces the tendency for dyskinesia. So you're not relying on levodopa to, for, to give the motor stimulus and therefore you have less dyskinesia. Maybe there'll be um, advances uh, in Parkinson's uh, with treatment of dyskinesia that are more specific. Um, the, uh, recently it's been shown that 
um, in Parkinson rats and and uh, in the macaque uh, model of Parkinson's, um, if you uh, give levodopa, you can show that there's significant upregulation of certain proteins, and one particular one called the RAS um, GRP1 protein, and um, levodopa itself is driving the upregulation of that protein. And then if you look uh, conversely, in uh, knockout uh, mice uh, that are, don't express this protein, um, they have far less, uh, well, they don't get dyskinesia. Um, so that's that's interesting. Yeah, I think it's I think it's not just the levodopa though that's causing it. Um, it's the way you you're giving the levodopa, and as I said, going back to um, to my my just clinical observation is that the the patients with the severest dyskinesia are the ones who are not that um, uh, rigorous in taking their medication early, and maybe we're not as rigorous enough in in making certain they don't wear off. And there there there, there is data that's been around for years showing in in the monkey models. Um, where you induce Parkinson's with MPTP uh, toxin, the dexamphetamine byproduct that showed up as Parkinson's in states in the West Coast in the 60s, 70s. Those um, uh, those pay, those monkeys, if you give dopamine every hour from the onset, they get very little dyskinesia. So there's clearly some receptor supersensitivity that's relevant. But anyway, watch this space for, for more advances um, uh, in the treatment of dyskinesia. But certainly, DBS can help. Next slide, please. Um, just, uh, you know, more advanced patients selecting for surgery. Um, you know, we, we used to just uh, think that if, you know, you're getting down to Parkinson's uh, levodopa, uh, dosage frequency of, you know, two hours, then you should consider more advanced treatment. Uh, I think probably um, the movement disorder neurologists uh, are serving people up for DBS, um, which is done in, in free centres in Sydney um, earlier, earlier. Um, and certainly you see people have really good responses. Again, Cognitive status is important, not too old, um, not uh, with severe psychiatric symptoms, um, and you definitely want to have people who are responsive to levodopa. Next slide, please. Um, I've, uh, I've, I've talked all, already about this. Um, again, clinical trials looking at the site, um, it probably doesn't matter that much. Next, next slide. Um, this is where the STN is. And as I said, in the past, we used to make lesions um, into the STN. Uh, and next slide. And those lesions were made by putting probes and freezing the brain. So actually using stereotactic surgery to put a guide and, and a long tube directly into the STN and, and freezing the, end, the area. Now we've got this uh, technique, and I'm not sure that's going to show that well, with this MR um, guided focused ultrasound, which is um, uh, unfortunately, there's I think there might be two two machines in Australia. Each of them costs about six million. There's one at St Vincent's, and um, Steve Tish and um, uh, Ben Yonkos, the surgeon, they're the ones who do it. And at the moment, there's there's a big backlog of people with a central tremor because it really works very well. Um, they tend to only do one side, so uh, if you've got a cent really bad essential tremor, they would do the contralateral side to your dominant hand. But it, you know, the results can be really quite remarkable, and um, you know, I think the follow-ups now are much longer than they used to, to be. So I think it, it tends to be a robust sort of treatment. But you can make the STN or the GPI lesion uh, for Parkinson's in the same way that we used to using standard lesional surgery 
uh, in the 90s. Um, and so that's non, this is non-invasive. So basically you have the patient wearing uh, a special uh, helmet which uh, shines um, high frequency ultrasound in beams and where the, you get the summation of the beams in one tiny little point, it's in, th it's in three dimensions. Uh, sorry, yeah, uh, it's firing from, from all the way around and the central tiny little, no, tiny little point is, um, is what gets the, the energy which causes a hole basically in the brain. You can see it on MRI. Um, I have the next slide, please. So, yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's a funny, it's a funny disease, Parkinson's. Um, if you go to, if you go to North America, if you go to, I've been to, you know, relatively recent American Academy of Neurology meetings as before COVID, you'd find that uh, neurologists there would say, um, don't mean agonists, far too dangerous drugs. Um, Sagiline, far too dangerous a drug, only use levodopa. But uh, I think the approach of starting with a dopamine agonist or, uh, and or resagiline and then moving to levodopa, it's, it's just convenient for the, the patients. Um, I didn't go into the potential issues, particularly with um, impulse control disorder that we know about. You've got to be really careful. And I, I, I now, um, like to see the relative um, in with the patient so everyone's aware of potential issues with impulse control disorder, which it has to be said rarely can occur with levodopa, but it's far less, far less prevalent. So starting with even stimulation with a dopamine agonist, then coming in with dopamine is my sort of preferred approach unless you've got someone who's older uh, to uh, and you want to know quickly if they respond. Now, um, I should say that uh, finally that that not everyone you think has Parkinson's disease has it, and um, I don't think we need to be uh, uh, feeling too depressed about getting the diagnosis wrong. We know from the UK uh, Parkinson's disease brain bank. Um, that you uh, even experienced neurologists in the UK who, you know, there might be one neurologist, well, when I was there, per two million people in the West Country. So they would only ever see people with neurodegenerative disease. So, um, and I mean, I mean we, we have over 300 patients with Parkinson's. We see a lot of Parkinson's. But if in the modern neurologist who does a lot of stroke work may not um, have that sort of experience, but even even very experienced neurologists will get it wrong. Uh, the final arbiter being um, looking at the brain, at, at the postmortem brain, in about eight percent of of people. And I always say to the the, the patients that you know, um, hey, this is a bit funny, where um, we don't seem to be making changes in in your treatment. And so you always ask yourself, uh, do they really have Parkinson's disease? And um, of course, the patient that doesn't respond at all, that's a red flag. So that very likely means that they've got some other neurodegenerative disease. People with vascular Parkinson's don't usually respond that well because it's a much more complex um, uh, pathophysiology. Um, but yeah, if you're not making changes, then they may not have it. And then sometimes I will take people off dopamine, uh, wean them off it. It's not a good idea to suddenly stop dopamine um, because they can really go quite rigid if they've got Parkinson's. So you wean them off it and you find they're no worse. Well, then you can turn around and say to the patient, look, I think we've got the diagnosis wrong. And you, you will get the diagnosis wrong. So just, I always say that to, to patients um, early on, we're going to start you off on treatment. We expect, because it looks like Parkinson's disease, that you'll respond to treatment. 
your symptoms will disappear, but then they will re-emerge. Um, over time, we will then have to make readjustments, and I call that rebalancing the system uh, to add in more treatment, to change the way we give it. And that's just the norm for Parkinson's. And, um, and then, of course, you know, in the early stages, you're very focused on the motor side, but as you know, then become the much more difficult issues such as dementia. Um, and, you know, after eight years, probably 80% of people have got cognitive impairment with Parkinson's. Um, the autonomic dysfunction, um, depression, hallucinations, psychosis, all of these issues just become more and more difficult as as time goes on and as we know and as you know you're seeing the patients with the more advanced parkinson's because you know they're in nursing homes uh, it's a it it's not a good disease we really need you know loads of money thrown at research to to try and work out you know what's the fundamental uh cause of these neurons dying off and uh, maybe it's going to come from one disease and then it'll be relevant to others um, you know i've been interested myself in research in antibodies to turn off neurodegeneration which we showed really for the first time that it could work in prion disease um, uh, certainly in rodents um, didn't work unfortunately at all in humans with cjd that's been done since but uh, the antibody mediate treatments for Alzheimer's, you probably know, are very controversial. Um, and people are vehemently against them getting approval um, in Australia and in the US. And um, but, you know, at the end of the day, um, yeah, we, we just need more and more research. It's a it's a tough ask doing research on neurodegeneration. And that's why, you know, disease like MS is advanced hugely because, you know, we have we have a much better idea what's going on in the disease. And, um, you know, we've, we're now probably up to 15 different drugs that modulate the immune system. And hey, MS is not really a brain disease. It's a disease of the immune system. So that's how we can that's how we can do something about it. With neurodegeneration, that's a primary neuronal uh, degenerative disease. That's that's a big problem. Um, and um, yeah, let's hope in the relatively near future there'll be advances, but we're still nutting out even the basic sort of path of pathophysiology of these um, of this protein aggregation and even the normal function of uh, of some of these important proteins. So anyway, I've rambled on far too long, um, but I'd be delighted to uh, take questions. If Everyone's people would type their questions into the chat. chat. I don't know, maybe the chat's not working properly. We do have a question through from Samantha. Ah, I can't see, so you'll have to then. Okay. Um, you mentioned deep brain stimulation and Dubbo. Is this available in the region? No, no. Um, we don't do brain surgery in, in regional Australia. Um, and this is particularly um, sophisticated, specialised, brain surgery. So very few neurosurgeons um, would be tooled up to do deep brain stimulation. And there's really only three centres in Sydney. Um, I'm not sure if they do it in the John Hunter. Don't think they do in Canberra. Um, yeah, so it's yeah, we don't we don't do neurosurgery in the country. Um, I think we should. Oh, we don't. 
got a question from um, Anthony. Is the Parkinson's associated with manganese, as in Groot Island, different in any way? The Parkinson's associated Crude Island, sorry. Groot, Groot Island. Groot Island. Um, I, I'm not sure. I, I know there's there are various syndromes in Guam, Parkinson dementia complex, but I don't know about the Groot Island. I'm afraid. I'd have to look that up. Another question um, is: Vertigo a common feature of Parkinson's or syndrome? Uh, no, so vertigo. Probably, if you see someone who uh, you know doesn't seem to be responding that well, and they have falls, and they they talk about dizziness, it's you think of PSP. Um, vertigo itself, um, obviously, vertigo is quite a common symptom generally, but it's not usually a feature of Parkinson's, and usually the autonomic um, dysfunction with postural hypotension, which can cause dizziness. It's amazing how because it starts quite slowly and creeps up on the patient. You know, people can be walking around with a, you know, systolic blood pressure standing of 70. And, you know, you ask them, do you feel dizzy? And they say no. But that can affect cognition, can generally affect balance. But true vertigo itself is not um, a common feature. I wouldn't think of that being a feature at all of Parkinson's. Could have more than one thing, of course. Question from Natalia. Is there evidence of the development of Parkinson's from long-term use of antipsychotic medications, as opposed to it masking symptoms of Parkinsonian symptoms? Uh, no, I don't think that long-term use is association, associated with the development of Parkinson's. And, you know, there's certainly patients who have been on long term antipsychotic medication and then they start to develop Parkinson's. I think that's very unusual. I can only, you know, I've just got a handful of patients like that and they've got Parkinson's disease because you you put them on dopamine and their motor sense system symptoms disappear and then you have to keep adjusting it in the usual sort of way. So. I mean, it's a relatively common disorder, Parkinson's. Um, There's no other questions tonight. Um, if you could take a moment before. Oh, sorry, we do have one more question from Linda. Does Parkinson's disease have any links to ECT? No. So there's no other questions. There's a QR code on your screen. Your screen, if you could take a second to complete an evaluation, we'd really appreciate your feedback. There's also a link in the chat if you wanted to go directly to the survey using that link. Thank you so much, Professor Hawke, for your time and for a great presentation tonight. Not at all. Look, um, if people want to send me a question, just my email address is simonhawk at gmail.com. So no dot. Between Simon and Hawk to send me a send me an email. Just put that in chat as well. Lovely. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. Thank you, Professor Hawk again. Have a good night. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.